Hello everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode in this series on animal physiology. I began this series by talking about animal development, and very general aspects of animal physiology. In the next episode, I talked about animal hydration, or how animals need water and how their bodies use and process water. Well, continuing down this line of thinking, today I'll be exploring animal nutrition. I'll be talking about how animals acquire and utilize the nutrients they get from their food, whether that food is the, the green, fiber-rich biomass of a plant, or the bloody, protein-rich biomass of a prey animal. Now, all animals need food, because food provides the physical biomatter that can be integrated into the animal's body. This food provides the nutrients that are used not just to grow and build new tissue, but to sustain what already exists, to engage in cellular metabolism and basal regulatory processes. Food and nutrients are required to fuel growth spurts and to sustain life, and the requisite energy needs, the, uh, the animal's calorie needs, determines what the animal eats and how much of it it eats from day to day. These are really important details, because some larger animals need to eat thousands of calories, or many tens of pounds of food every day, just to maintain their body mass. If they want to grow, they have to eat even more. Smaller animals with a high metabolic rate typically burn a tremendous amount of calories that are disproportionate to their size, and in turn, they require a large quantity of food relative to their body size. Other organisms, like reptiles, are cold-blooded, and they have relatively low metabolic rates. These organisms, these cold-blooded reptiles, can survive by eating a single meal every few days, or even every few weeks. That one little burst of nutrients is enough to sustain them for days or weeks because their metabolic rate is so low, their nutrient demands and their energy demands are very low. Now, whatever kind of organism you're talking about, in cases where the animal doesn't get enough food, where they're, where they're starving, they might get increasingly desperate, but more and more exhausted, to the point that they fall down this vicious circle where they don't even have the energy to capture food if they tried. These animals are doomed to starvation, unless something edible literally drops dead right in front of their face. All organisms need certain amounts of chemical energy, and certain amounts and certain types of nutrients. All animals have the capability to digest their food, and turn the nutrients into usable chemical building blocks. Now consider this example. Humans have the genes for the enzymes to synthesize 12 amino acids, which are used to build proteins. But remember that there's 20 different amino acids, and if our bodies can only naturally synthesize 12 of them, then what about the other 8 amino acids? Well, uh, those other 8 amino acids, we have to get those from our diet, from the foods that we eat. These are thus called essential amino acids, because they are essential to a healthy human diet. We need them to stay healthy. Now, in all animals, you know, more generally speaking, Essential nutrients are those nutrients that can't be synthesized by the body, and they must be obtained by eating other organisms. Animals also need vitamins, minerals, and electrolytes. Vitamins are carbon-containing compounds that the body needs in trace amounts, so very small quantities are all that's needed to keep an animal healthy. Minerals are inorganic substances used for structural or enzymatic purposes, like the calcium phosphate in your bones, or the iron in the hemoglobin in your blood cells. The electrolytes are a subset of the minerals, as these are mineral ions involved in things like water balance. Think sodium ions, potassium ions, and chloride ions. These are all pumped across membranes so as to set up and sustain concentration gradients, and they're pumped into or out of cells to influence osmolarity and the osmotic gradient. All right, so now that I've gotten some of the, the very basic context established, it's time to begin the journey through the digestive system to experience what it's like to be a piece of food consumed by an animal and to learn how this food gets absorbed into the animal and used to make biomass. The very first step in this journey is the mouth. All food must enter the digestive system through this anterior orifice. Despite its relatively simple purpose, the structure of the mouth varies wildly across the animal kingdom, 
because there's so many different techniques for acquiring and handling different kinds of food. In the first episode of this series, I briefly talked about these different eating techniques, but I didn't go into too much detail. So I'm going to go over that topic again in greater detail right now. Alright, so I first mentioned filter feeding, which is a method wherein a scoop or a gulp of some kind of food-containing matrix is brought into the mouth, and then filter structures are used to separate the inedible soil or the waste material from the actual food items, which are then ingested. For example, consider the baleen whale. A baleen whale will take a huge gulp of their food-containing matrix, which is ocean water. They'll take a huge gulp of ocean water. And then, using their tongue, they'll push the ocean water out of their mouth, but they'll have their teeth closed, or their, I should say, their baleen closed. And so the water will get filtered through this baleen, but the krill won't. The krill will get stuck on their baleen, and they'll, they'll form like a, a wet, squishy residue that the whale will just lick off the inside of its, of its baleen and swallow, and that's how they eat. That's how they filter feed krill. Similarly, whale sharks will do the same thing to filter feed on plankton. And flamingos also filter feed, as they take scoops out of the mud and strain out brine shrimp. Perhaps the most simple and rudimentary filter feeding system belongs to the sponges. The sponge's entire body is just a system of pores and channels that water flows through. And the whole point of having all of these pores and channels is to increase the surface area so that you can maximally strain food particles out of the water. Then there's deposit feeding or the eating of detritus, or dead stuff. And this usually involves the animal moving along the floor of the environment, through the accumulated layers of dead and decaying organic uh, detritus, and eating that for food. This detritus is literally consumed in chunks, or pieces, or discrete mouthfuls, and then just broken down like normal during the detrivore's digestive process, where it will eventually get excreted as nutrient-rich soil. These detrivore animals include slugs and sea cucumbers, wood lice and earthworms, and all sorts of other such scum-sucking bottom-feeding critters. And despite this relatively inglorious description, these deposit feeders are actually really important for ecosystem health. I mean, just consider earthworms, which help to break down detritus in the soil and produce more soil that then feeds fungus and plants, which then support the greater ecosystem. So these, these detrivores, these deposit feeders, have a really critical role to play in the ecosystem. There are also fluid feeders, which literally get all of their nutrients by sucking up or absorbing the nutrient-rich fluids secreted by other organisms, like, for example, flowering plants. You have nectarivores, like moths, bees, hummingbirds, and some bats, which will consume this sugar-rich nectar right out of the flowers. There's another type of uh, fluid-feeding bat called the vampire bat. The vampire bat is a hematophage, which is a type of animal that feeds off of the blood of other animals, like a parasitic worm, or a leech, or an arthropod, or some kind of lamprey, or a vampire finch, or the vampire bats. Now, the final food consumption technique is straightforward, brutish, and violent. It's called mass feeding, and it involves the animal literally just tearing pieces of flesh off of the body of its prey. Herbivores, for example, will bite and chew the leaves of plants, which causes stress to the plants. I mean, consider this from the plant's perspective. Their leaves, which are valuable little sugar factories that took a fair bit of energy and carbon investment to grow in the first place, they're just getting ripped off and destroyed. And then you also have carnivorous mass feeders, which will catch a prey animal and just tear the meat off its bones. Depending on the predator, the death of the prey animal is not actually a prerequisite to beginning the meal. For example, consider uh, large cats, like tigers or lions. When these carnivores attack their prey, they'll usually kill it pretty quickly, as fast as they can. Sometimes they'll play with their food, but by the time they actually start eating, usually the prey is dead. Contrast this with a bear, like a grizzly bear or a polar bear. A bear will hunt down its prey and capture it, and then just use a big, heavy paw to hold it down. And as the prey is squirming and struggling and trying to escape, the bear, you know, just holding down its prey with a paw, will lean down and just rip off chunks with its mouth. They'll just rip apart their prey as it's alive, pinned and squirming and squealing underneath the paw. 
this is why bears are particularly scary. And if you if you had a choice, you really wouldn't want to be taken out by a bear because it's it's pretty horrible. Anyway, mass feeders consume their biomass with mouth parts that are shaped for their kind of prey. Large herbivores, for example, like ungulates, have broad, flat teeth that are evolutionarily designed for grinding up leaves and plant matter. And smaller herbivores, like herbivorous insects, have sharp-edged mandibles that they use for cutting bits of leaf down into smaller, chewable pieces, or uh, pieces that they can carry back to the nest. Carnivores typically have much sharper teeth, which are used to pierce and slice and tear at the flesh of other animals. Some carnivores, like leatherback sea turtles, have evolved projections growing out of the surface of their mouth and throat. And these projections are like small little thorns that all point down the throat. So when the leatherback sea turtle eats a prey animal, like a fish, if it gets swallowed alive, the fish will struggle to escape. But all of these inward, downward pointing barbs will poke into the fish's body and prevent them from escaping back out the sea turtle's mouth. Among the fish themselves, the shape of the teeth will vary depending on the prey. Some fish eat algae, and they have slate-like, flat surface teeth that are perfect for scraping up and compacting algae. There's fish that eat shelled animals, like snails or crabs or bivalves, and they have to break the shells to get to the soft meat inside. And so these fish have teeth that are cylindrical with pointed tips, designed so as to apply the maximum pressure to the smallest point, to break that shell and get to the, the soft meat inside. The fish that eat other fish have sharp, spiny teeth, optimized for tearing through scales and ripping up fish meat. In some species, uh, based on their evolutionary condition or their body size or whatever prey they happen to, to hunt, the morphology of their mouth has evolved into an extreme. Consider the snake, whose jaw can unhinge to consume pieces of food larger than its head. Or you have birds that have disproportionately large beaks, designed to, to hunt and carry large prey, or so that they can reach into otherwise hard-to-reach places. And you also have animals like penguins and hagfish, whose jaws are lined with multiple rows of teeth. However the animal does it, they acquire food, and this food ends up in their mouth. In animals, the mouth is more than just the entry point into the digestive system. The mouth is the first stage for digestion itself. Pretty much all mass feeders have some kind of teeth, which they use to mechanically degrade, soften, and break apart their food into smaller pieces. This mechanical destruction of the food makes it significantly easier to digest by increasing the surface area available to react with digestive enzymes. Some of these digestive enzymes are secreted in the mouth, in the saliva, and they soak into the food as the animal chews it. For example, humans express salivary amylase in the mouth when eating food. You know, it's, it's in your saliva. This salivary amylase enzyme is able to break down larger carbohydrates. It can, it can break them down into simpler sugars. Humans also express an enzyme called lingual lipase, which basically does the same thing, but instead of uh, breaking down carbohydrates, it does it to lipids. Lingual lipase begins the digestion of fats by breaking triglycerides down into diglycerides and fatty acids. So after handling the food with the mouth, after chewing and softening with enzymes, the food is swallowed. From this point on, the swallowed mass of food is called a bolus. The ground-up mass of leaf tissue swallowed by a little lizard is a bolus. So is the fish that gets killed and eaten by a sea anemone. That's the bolus. And so is the shredded, bloody mass of lamb meat going down the throat of a lion. That's the bolus. Even the nectar flowing down the gullet of a hummingbird can be called a bolus. Anyway, this bolus will be carried down the esophagus, partly through gravity and partly through some kind of peristaltic motion. The esophagus is the part of the tube that connects the mouth to the stomach. All right, so if we return to that food tube metaphor that I used to describe animals in the first episode of the series, if animals are a food tube, then the esophagus is the part of that tube that connects the mouth to the stomach. In many animals, the esophagus is a relatively simple tube section that just tunnels deep into the literal belly of the organism. But in other animals, like most vertebrates, this section of the digestive tract has to coexist and cooperate with respiratory organs, 
like the trachea and the windpipe. These vertebrate animals that have this coexisting uh, esophagus windpipe structure, these animals are at greater risk of suffocation by choking on their food. In many species of bird, the esophagus has a pseudo-chamber, which is like a widened segment in the esophagus that forms a little cavity. This space in the throat is called a crop, and the bird uses it to store food and regulate the flow of food down into the stomach. The crop is really helpful because it allows the bird to gather and hold a lot of food at once, and then fly away somewhere safe so it can digest it all in peace. In some species, the crop even acts as a mini-stomach, or a, or a second mouth, where certain kinds of digestive enzymes get released to help soften up the food and prep it for further digestion. The earliest animal digestive systems are called incomplete digestive tracts, because they consist of a gastrovascular cavity with a single stomach and esophagus region, and only one orifice. In all of these primitive animals, their mouth and anus are the same orifice. Food comes in and waste goes out of the same opening. These primitive animals include the likes of sea anemones and jellyfish. In the jellyfish, this opening is at the bottom of the main body structure, surrounded by stinging tentacles. The tentacles can help bring food into the mouth, where it will then go into the gastrovascular cavity to be dissolved. The nutrients are absorbed, and the wastes are retained in the cavity until they get released through the same opening that the food originally came in through. If there are incomplete digestive systems, then in contrast, there are complete digestive systems. A complete digestive system is a one-directional digestive tract that has a single opening in the front and a single opening at the end. The vast majority of animals have a complete digestive system, because a complete digestive system provides numerous advantages over an incomplete system. For example, if the mouth doesn't have to double as an anus, then the mouth can specialize for eating particular food sources. This encourages diversification and adaptation to various niches, which promotes ecological development and speciation. If the mouth is specialized, then larger masses of food can also be eaten, and the mouth itself can become a weapon, or a tool for handling items just like paws or tentacles or an elephant's trunk. The complete digestive system is also characterized by one-way flow of traffic, and that also offers an advantage. A one-way digestive tract means that you can continuously eat, as you can continuously process and excrete food, as opposed to having to alternate between periods of feeding in periods where feeding is impossible because the gastrovascular cavity is full of digesting food and waste, and all of that waste is soon going to be pushed out. It's hard to eat food if waste is coming out of that same orifice. Now, building off of this, a one-way digestive tract shuttles the bolus along a linear tract, which can be segmented and divided into discrete compartments, or chambers. Various chemical solutions involved in digestion can be isolated to one particular compartment, and the bolus basically goes through the opposite of an assembly line. The animal digestive tract is kind of like a de-assembly line, where the bolus is chemically softened and dissolved one step at a time, and the resulting nutrient-rich goop gets absorbed. This can happen optimally if the bolus is being passed along a sequential series of digestive steps, each taking place in a discrete compartment that's been evolutionarily specialized for some specific aspect of complete digestion. Now this is where the stomach comes in, because the stomach is the first of these specialized chambers. The stomach is a large bag of smooth muscle, sealed with two powerful sphincter muscles at the top and bottom, and the inside is lined with rapidly reproducing epithelial cells, like parietal cells that secrete an acidic gastric juice into the stomach cavity. When food comes into the stomach, a few cells will produce and release a hormone called gastrin, which then stimulates these parietal cells to produce the stomach acid. The layers of smooth muscle wrapping around the stomach will flex and ripple, which mechanically stirs the contents of the stomach, churning the food in a pool of acid. The stomach acid itself is composed mostly of hydrochloric acid, which activates a protein called pepsinogen. The low pH is like a safety trigger that activates pepsinogen and turns it into pepsin, which is an enzyme that breaks the peptide bonds between the amino acid monomers in a protein. It's really important that the generation of pepsin is regulated by a pH lock, so that pepsin only exists when there's food that needs to be dissolved. 
Without this pH lock, without this regulation, pepsin would be activated randomly or when it shouldn't be activated, and it will start to take apart the proteins in the healthy cells that produce it. In essence, the highly acidic environment of the stomach breaks proteins up into smaller polypeptide chunks, and it also helps to kill off many kinds of pH-sensitive bacteria that came in with the food. And perhaps most importantly, the highly acidic environment is a regulatory mechanism for the enzymes that help to break down proteins and other parts of the food. This regulatory mechanism is important because otherwise those enzymes would dissolve the animal itself from the inside out. And obviously, that's, that's bad. <laughs> the animal doesn't want that to happen. Now, all animals need proteins, but they often get their protein from different sources. A carnivore is going to eat the body of another animal, and this other animal's body is going to be packed with protein, especially in its muscles. So it makes sense that the carnivore would have a stomach that specializes in breaking down peptide bonds and cutting proteins into little polypeptide chunks. However, other animals don't eat food that's rich in protein, like herbivores. The plants that an herbivore eats still possess protein, but relatively little protein compared to meat. The dominant chemical in plant tissue is cellulose, so herbivore stomachs have adapted to break down cellulose. Many of these herbivores, like antelope, cows, sheep, and goats, for example, are called ruminants, because they possess a rumen, which is kind of like a large stomach. But instead of secreting stomach acid, the rumen instead uses symbiotic populations of bacteria that live inside the rumen to ferment and break down the cellulose. This rumen organ maintains an oxygen-free environment, and this enables the fermentation process. The bacterial fermentation of the plant matter produces fatty acids, which get absorbed for energy. Partially digested plant matter will get shuttled to an adjacent cavity called a reticulum, which is much smaller than the rumen, but it generally serves the same purpose. After dissolving in the rumen and the reticulum for a while, the plant bolus will get regurgitated back into the mouth, and the ruminant animal will chew on it some more to help break it down. This regurgitated, partially digested food is called cud. Chances are you've heard the phrase, chewing their cud. The phrase has various meanings depending on the context. For example, to describe someone who likes hearing themselves talk. And it originated with this barfed-up, half-dissolved plant food getting re-chewed and re-swallowed to ensure complete digestion. Anyway, after the rumen and the reticulum, the twice-chewed, twice-digested bolus is moved into a third cavity called the omasum, where some of the water and mineral nutrients that are present in the bolus will get absorbed. It's only at this point, after this involved process, that the bolus actually makes it into the ruminant's true stomach, which is called an abomasum. It's only here, in the abomasum, that the ruminant uses its own digestive enzymes to break down food as opposed to relying on some symbiotic bacterial population to break it down for them. So a few minutes ago, I talked about how many species of birds have a crop, which is like a space in their throats where they can store food. There's another organ in the bird's digestive system that is unique, and it's called the gizzard. The gizzard is a modified type of stomach, but it does not use particular enzymes or symbiotic bacteria to break down food. Instead, the gizzard relies on powerful muscles and a coarse, gritty texture to mechanically grind away at food. Birds will often consume sand or small rocks, which will get trapped in the gizzard and provide a gritty texture that can easily wear down hard foods like seeds or the scales of small animals. The birds will utilize this kind of mechanistic organ to compensate for the fact that they can't actually chew. Birds can't chew their food, they can't break it down with their teeth. So to make up for this deficit, they have the gizzard, which uses sand and rocks and powerful muscles to grind and break down the food kind of like sandpaper. However the animal does it, however the animal breaks down its food, be it enzymatic activity, bacterial fermentation, mechanical breakdown, or any combination of the above, whatever happens, small amounts of dissolved bolus will get shuttled past the stomach's lower sphincter to make it into the small intestine. However, the small intestine is rather delicate, and so all of this incoming food, this incoming bolus, it's more of a fluid at this point after it's been broken down by the stomach, when it comes into the small intestine, it's called chyme, and it's soaked in really acidic gastric juices. 
If something isn't done about this, the residual stomach acids coming in with the chyme will damage the small intestine. In response to this problem, the animals evolved to secrete a basic chemical that neutralizes the stomach acids. In humans, the beginning of the small intestine is populated with Brunner's glands, which have cells that secrete an alkaline solution with dissolved bicarbonate ions in it. And this secretion from these Brunner's glands, in addition to similar bicarbonate released from the pancreas, will neutralize the stomach acid and protect the small intestine. If you'd like an illustrative metaphor, think of it kind of like spraying water on a fire. Alright, so let me really briefly explain the environment of the small intestine, so you, you understand the context of where all of this stuff is happening. The small intestine is a tubular portion of the digestive tract that's relatively long. In humans, it's 20 feet long. The length of the small intestine is purely designed to increase surface area, and that's the key detail to understand here. The small intestine has a massive surface area, so as to maximize the absorption of nutrients. Now, you might be wondering, how is there a huge surface area on the inside of a long but narrow tube? Well, it's because the inner surface of this narrow tube is actually extremely rippled and covered in a carpet of protrusions. At the largest scale, the inner lining is characterized by numerous folds and flaps, as if the lining was a fabric with much greater surface area than the tube it was stuffed into. Furthermore, this wavy sheet of internal epithelial tissue is covered in structures called villi, which are like little finger-shaped projections that poke perpendicularly out of the surface. The millions of these villi poking up increase the surface area tremendously, and this is also because the villi are covered in cells that project dozens of smaller villi, or microvilli, out of the apical surface. These billions of microvilli wave around on the surface of the epithelial lining increasing its surface area by orders of magnitude more than just a simple flat sheet. This massive surface area on the inside of the small intestine facilitates widespread nutrient absorption, so the animal can absorb as much of the nutrients as possible out of its food. The pancreas and the liver will secrete many digestive enzymes into the small intestine, and this will help with the continual breakdown of nutrients, but it's in a cellular environment that's a little less caustic than it was in the stomach. When food reaches the small intestine, it sends a hormone called secretin as a chemical messenger to the pancreas, telling the pancreas to deliver some of these digestive enzymes. The pancreas will then produce inactive proteases, which are enzymes that break down proteins, and it will release these inactive proteases into the small intestine through the pancreatic duct. The pancreas will also produce a chemical called trypsinogen, and when this is released into the small intestine, the trypsinogen will react with an enzyme there called enterokinase, and this will produce trypsin. This is important because the enzyme trypsin will then go on to activate all of those inactive proteases, which, now that they're activated, will start breaking down proteins. The large variety of proteases will then get to work breaking down the polypeptide chunks into amino acid monomers. The liver produces compounds called bile salts which are mixed in a solution and stored in the gallbladder before getting released into the small intestine. These bile salts, contained within the slimy solution called bile, are integral for lipid digestion. Remember that lipid molecules tend to have hydrophobic segments, which makes it difficult for them to dissolve in aqueous solutions. The bile is an emulsifying agent. The bile will break up the lipid membranes and allow them to be dissolved into smaller chunks that can be rapidly digested by lipase enzymes. This digestive activity breaks up the lipids into small molecules, like monoglycerides and fatty acids, and these are easily absorbed by diffusion across the membranes of the villi and the microvilli lining the small intestine. Once inside these epithelial cells, the lipid masses are coated with proteins, which works kind of like a, a transport manifest so that the incoming lipid nutrients are directed to the right place where they, they need to go so that they can be broken down and digested and integrated into the body's biochemistry. Proteins and carbohydrates are also absorbed through the villi and microvilli, where they get processed and sent into the bloodstream. The proteins get broken down into amino acids, then the cells of the small intestine will end up spending ATP to actively transport those amino acids across the membrane. The same is true for carbohydrates, which get broken down into glucose. 
The small intestine's epithelial cells will use a sodium-potassium pump to establish a sodium concentration gradient, which will bring sodium into the cells. A cotransporter protein will tap into this concentration gradient by binding with a glucose molecule and a sodium ion, and then changing conformation to move both of them into the cells. Once past the cell's membrane, the glucose will diffuse into the blood, where it can be accessed by other cells for energy or for carbon to build stuff with. It's also important to understand that as all of these solutes are being absorbed into the cells, the cellular osmolarity increases, and water will follow into the cell through osmosis. So water will get absorbed out of the food at the same time as the nutrients. After moving along the small intestine, the remaining food mass, the remaining bolus, is passed into the large intestine. And this is where the digestive process is clearly winding down. The vast majority of the nutrients and most of the water have been absorbed by this point, so the large intestine's primary purpose is to absorb any last little bits of water and any remaining ions and nutrients. It's like, it's like the cleanup stage at the very end of the process before the bolus gets excreted as waste. And this is true for pretty much all animals. It's true in humans, and it's true in the hindgut of insects. In some species of herbivores, like rabbits, elephants, horses, and some primates, the beginning of the large intestine has a sac growing off of it called a cecum, which is kind of like a, a mini rumen. The cecum contains symbiotic bacteria and protists that help further break down cellulose. Humans have a cecum, which is the first little pocketed area of our large intestine, and coming off of it is the appendix. The appendix isn't vital to life, which means that it can be removed but it is believed to serve an important function. The appendix appears to hold a wide range of symbiotic microbes, and it works kind of like a seed vault for helping to keep the intestines populated with a healthy gut biome. So if the organism were to get some kind of disease that causes, for example, diarrhea that leads to it flushing out its gut and removing a lot of its gut microbes, it's uh, removing a lot of its gut microbiome, the appendix, with its reserve populations of bacteria, can reseed the intestines, or recolonize bacteria throughout the intestines. The final stages of digestion take place at the very end of the large intestine, or at the end of the hindgut, where the remaining biomass is generally composed of waste. This waste is compacted and compiled into a dense mass of feces, which is then removed from the body through excretion out of the anus. This represents the complete journey of food through the digestive system of an animal, from recently captured prey organism, ingested through the mouth at one end, made into a bolus, dissolved into chyme, compressed into feces, and excreted out the other end. The process of digestion works to extract as much of the nutrients out of the food as possible, and these nutrients, be they proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, mineral ions, or whatever else, they're all allowed to diffuse into the bloodstream. The blood, or the hemolymph in the case of insects, circulates throughout the animal's body and saturates its tissues with these nutrients. The tissues, the, the cells that work to keep the animal alive, they absorb these nutrients and use them to build new proteins, new membranes, new carbohydrates, all new stuff that the animal needs to perpetuate itself as a healthy biochemical superstructure. All right, everyone, that's about it for animal nutrition. If you're really digging this series on animal physiology, then be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode, which will continue the fun of animal physiology by exploring animal sensoria. I'll be talking about all of the different kinds of sensory structures that animals have evolved to detect the world around them, including eyes and ears and noses and proprioceptors and pain receptors to organs that can detect magnetic fields and even ways that animals can perceive the passage of time itself. If that sounds at all interesting, and trust me, it will be, then be sure to check it out. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, then check out the store or become a patron at a tier of your choosing. If you don't quite have any money on hand to support the podcast, that's okay. You can support the podcast in other ways. Share some of your favorite episodes with your friends or tell your friends and family about the channel and let them explore it on their own. Anything you do to support the podcast really helps, and I really appreciate it. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>